Thus far, Bob, we've covered the ecumenical creeds and the catechisms of Luther. Now we come to a document called the Augsburg Confession. It has an entirely different name than the ones we use, like I said, for the creeds and the catechisms. That's right. And its author, Philip Melanchthon, who was a, a colleague at the University of Wittenberg alongside Luther uh, in the faculty there, Melanchthon didn't arrive at the title Confession right at the beginning of his work on this, this statement. The emperor, Charles V, at this time, the ruler not only actually of the Holy Roman Empire, but of Spain, parts of Italy, the New World, the most powerful man uh, on earth, or at least in Europe, uh, between uh, Charlemagne in the 9th century and Napoleon in the 19th century, Charles V, was unsettled. He was worried. He was disturbed by the fact that Luther's call for reform had, had uh, begun changes across his empire that he wasn't uh, in control of. He was afraid that if people no longer respect and followed and obeyed the pope in the religious sphere, they wouldn't follow him, obey him, respect him in the political sphere. And so in late 1529 and early 1530, he called the representatives of the various governments, both city governments and uh, territorial governments throughout Germany together, asked them to come to the city of Augsburg for the national legislature, the imperial diet. The diet did not meet regularly as our Congress meets in the United States, but the diet met at the will uh, of the emperor. And Charles V asked the Lutheran princes to come and to explain why they were uh, introducing and undertaking the reforms of church life that, that they were uh, introducing in the 1520s. So the theologians at the University of Wittenberg decided that they would draft a document that explained why they had uh, abandoned uh, clerical celibacy, why they were making changes in the liturgy of the mass, why they were uh, rejecting certain customs and, and traditions such as the, uh, the withholding of the cup of the Lord's blood from the laity. And they prepared that in a document we often call the Torgau Articles, even though we don't really know exactly what document goes under that uh, title. Uh, there, were, there were memoranda prepared to present to the emperor. When the princes from, from Luther's and Melanchthon's government, the Saxon government, got to the city of Augsburg, they met with other Lutheran representatives from cities and territories in other parts of Germany. And there they began to work on a statement explaining their reforms. But on the streets of Augsburg, they also found uh, a new uh, attack upon the Wittenberg Reformation by a, by a notable theologian, John Eck, that accused them of every imaginable heresy. And so Melanchthon decided that he needed to, to compose a defense of Lutheran teaching that would explain precisely how and why the Lutherans believed that they were part of the universal church. It was their claim to being the true church of God, a part of the Catholic tradition, fully as, as much as their opponents, who were still in obedience to the Roman pontiff. And so Melanchthon began to uh, draw on other documents that he and his colleagues had prepared for various kinds of negotiations in the years just before uh, they came to Augsburg in 1530. And he was working away at composing this uh, document that was going to defend the reforms that, that the Lutherans were introducing. And it occurred to him that it was not a, a defense that he was making. It was a confession of the faith. Now, since ancient times, Christians had talked about confessing their faith. St. Paul talks about the confession of the faith, and St. Augustine uh, 
had talked about his own experiences as a kind of confession, but it was a confession that also presented the Christian faith. Luther himself had taken up this word confession as a word that simply presented what he believed, what he was teaching, but in, in a, well, we might say a bold way, a forthright way, a way that, that he wanted to bring the message uh, straight to, to his hearers, to the, to the people. Now, in your book, Bob, on confessing the faith, you indicate that there are three aspects to confession that are all exemplified by the Augsburg Confession. When Melanchthon chose the word confession for the document he was writing, there weren't really medieval models. No one had quite decided to define the church as Melanchthon was deciding to define the church in and through a confession of the faith. It was a new usage for the word, even though Luther and Augustine and even St. Paul had talked about confessing the faith. So as the Lutherans began to negotiate with the emperor and with Roman Catholic theologians, they were confessing the faith simply in the actions that they performed. They, they thought of the confessing of the faith uh, as something you, you do. During the course of the Diet of Augsburg, as they talked back and forth, it became clear that the confession of the faith also involved some specific content. They were confessing specific things. But by the end of the time they were together, the several months of 1530 they were together, Melanchthon had taken the act of confessing and the content of confessing and put them together in a document. And the Augsburg Confession as a document shows us another side of the impact of Martin Luther's meeting Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, Gutenberg actually died a couple generations before Luther was on the scene. But um, Gutenberg's invention of movable type enabled the printing press to give printed or written documents a whole new significance and a whole new way of acting and influencing Christian teaching, public Christian sharing of, of the faith. So when Melanchthon decided that this document is going to be called a confession and the document was written out and then printed, this confession of faith could do more than Augustine's confession had done, than even Luther's confession had done it could bring to a widespread part of the church the words of this definition of what it means to be a universal, a member of the universal church, a Catholic Christian. And so what we have in the Augsburg Confession is really not only a new definition of the center of the Christian gospel that, that you can't find in this form in the Middle Ages, but you also have a new way of defining the church, of confessing the faith, that, that comes together. Now, as I heard you talk, this was a diet or a meeting convened by the emperor and those who attended and were participants were government officials. Uh, how is it that they are deciding church doctrine, or maybe I should put it another way, is the question of uh, unity of the church or the unity of the empire, or were they wrestling with uh, what it means to be a church, or what does it mean to be a citizen within the empire? How do all these things come together? It's not easy for, for modern day Americans to understand, because we think that one of the most important principles of our way of government is the separation of church and state. Church and state never are all that separate, of course. It, in a way, this is a, a myth that deceives us, that we, with which we deceive ourselves. Because public policy always has a religious and ethical dimension. There's always something greater than mere politics that holds a society, a culture together. And, and Lutherans and Roman Catholics in the 16th century were very well aware of that. And so Charles V believed that God had given him responsibility for the welfare of his people in every way. And uh, also the Lutheran princes, like Luther's prince, uh, 
Elector John of Saxony, believed they had an, an obligation to make sure that the truth that God had revealed in Scripture was delivered to their people in a way that was unambiguous and clear and would bring them to salvation. And so the emperor, Charles V, was just looking out for the good of his people. And John, the elector of Saxony, wanted his people to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so that's why these politicians were so anxious and eager to arrive at what really was true, correct, faithful teaching uh, of the scriptures. And so what you have in Augsburg in 1530 is indeed a public policy debate, but at the very same time, it is a, a discussion that had huge significance and many implications for the way in which society would be run and in which the leadership would understand uh, how society was to be run. A couple of times now you've talked about the Augsburg Confession as uh, confessing that the Lutherans were Catholic, mm -hmm. why that was necessary over and against Charles uh, V. In other words, uh, what else is going on mm -hmm. that the princes have to give an account to the emperor? Well, there's a theological concern and there's also a political concern, I think. Since the time of the emperor Theodosius, a thousand years earlier, it had been part of the law of the Roman Empire and then this German Empire that still called itself the Holy Roman Empire uh, that, that specified what it meant to be a Christian and to be a Christian meant to be a citizen of the empire uh, by the time of Theodosius. And so there were certain definitions uh, that, that, that made Lutheranism either legal or illegal. And so Melanchthon is very much concerned in the Augsburg Confession to show that Lutherans were teaching and teaching faithfully what the universal church, the whole church of God, had always taught. And so he makes the argument really in two ways, by the positive teaching and also by condemning ancient heretics that Theodosius had also condemned in what was the law of the land. At the same time, it was very important for Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon to say, we are the true church. It's not as though there are many ways to explain the Bible. There is truth and there is falsehood. And they believed that falsehood in public teaching on, on the biblical truths would lead people away from God, would lead to their damnation. Or if the errors weren't so serious that they were, were going to condemn these believers, they would at least make their lives more insecure, more unsure of the faith, more miserable. And so the uh, proper confession of the truth of God was of utmost importance for Luther and Melanchthon. Now the Augsburg Confession is a much lengthier document than the creeds or the catechisms, and it has an entirely different structure to it. I think in part, again, that's due to uh, Johannes Gutenberg's having come on the scene a little bit before Luther and Melanchthon. You could actually put a good deal more into a document that was, to be sure, going to be read aloud for the ear, but then put in print and read uh, by people years later and many, many miles away. And so the Augsburg Confession is longer in part simply because uh, the means of communication had made a longer document possible as an effective tool of communicating the heart of the faith. In addition, the emperor had called upon the Lutherans to explain themselves, and they wanted to explain themselves quite thoroughly. They, in the second half of the document, they wanted to explain what they were doing as they changed the customs, the life of the church. So they had a fairly long discussion of fasting and the so-called distinction of foods, uh, or of monastic practices, uh, or of communion in, in both kinds, as we say, communion uh, in giving both the body of our Lord and the blood of our Lord to people. And in the first part of the document, although Melanchthon there is in some ways briefer, uh, 
he still is explaining in some detail some of the doctrinal points that both affirm wh why the Lutherans regarded themselves as Catholics, as part of the universal church. And then Melanchthon goes into some detail, but is still relatively brief, on certain parts of the Wittenberg proclamation that maybe was a little bit strange, such as justification by faith. So what you have is a document, again, of two parts, 21 articles that show that this is the faith of the scriptures, the faith of the ancient church, and then seven more articles on specific issues of reform of 16th century church life as well as church teaching. I sense as I read the first 21 articles that there is a certain flow to the articles or a certain rationale to the articles that to my eyes look a little bit like the Apostles' Creed. I think there is a creedal structure. You begin with God, the person of God, you go on to salvation, and then you go on really to the work of the Holy Spirit, starting already in the fifth and sixth articles, as you talk about how the Holy Spirit brings us, first of all, to new obedience, and then uses the, uh, the Word of God, chiefly in sacramental form, uh, because of the issues that had to be discussed in the 16th century, um, into the church, uh, so that the church can, as the people of God, practice the things that are discussed in the, second, uh, in the second part of the Augsburg Confession. So we have part one, which is the Articles of Faith or Doctrine, and these pretty much expand for us things already covered in the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. And part two deals with issues of practice. Mm -hmm. Discuss for a moment the overarching theme of the Augsburg Confession that binds all of this into a unity. It is a confession that God is our God. It is a confession that God acts in the midst of a sinful world to restore human beings to the righteousness, to the, the integrity, we might say, uh, that he gave us in the, in the first place. And it talks about how the Holy Spirit does that, as I just said, uh, as the Word of God comes to us in various forms. And then it reminds us that um, the life of faith, in Article 20, is a life of good works, and goes on to talk specifically about how to understand that life, particularly in the context of 16th century church life. The 20th and 21st articles uh, of the Augsburg Confession, the two final articles of the, um, of the doctrinal section, we might say, are officially titled Faith and Good Works and the Invocation of the Saints. But some would say that faith and good works is really about how to preach the Word of God so that people live pious lives. And Invocation of the Saints not only talks about why we don't pray to the saints, but talks about proper prayer as the beginning of the response, as we talked about in the Catechism, uh, the beginning of our response, the response of our lives to God. In that way, you could say that the Augsburg Confession is echoing Luther's catechisms. I've never thought about it that way. I guess I always regard it as Articles 18 through 21 as something of an appendix mm -hmm. uh, to the first 17, since the 17th ends with the return of Christ. Yeah. But I suspect we'll go into this in greater depth in our next session. Mm -hmm.